Spring is popping out all over, and it's time for spring cleaning. Be sure you don't forget your duct work. Call Premier Heating and Air today and clear the dust from your ducts and keep your unit running smoothly. Through the end of April, receive a free indoor air treatment system with the price of a whole home duct cleaning. And with temperatures heating up, make sure you keep your cool with a $49 AC checkup special. Need a new unit? Get up to $2,000 off qualifying systems. Schedule a visit and get a quote today at premierishere.com. The choice is clear. Choose Premier. Premier Heating and Air, a locally owned and operated company. Offer ends April 30th. Welcome to our TV 35 Dublin Lawrence County Chamber 2024 Political Forum. We're going to get started now with our forum for our Superior Court Judge. And tonight we have with us Mr. Trey Taylor, Mr. Brad Childers, and Mr. Brandon Faircloth. And as our current um, serving Superior Court Judge, we're gonna start with you tonight, Mr. Trey Taylor, and ask you to give a two minute opening statement. Great, thank you, Heath. Uh, thank you to uh, Heath Taylor and TV35 for putting this on. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Trey Taylor. I'm your current Superior Court Judge. Uh, I was appointed eight months ago to replace uh, Judge Donald Gillis. Um, I have a family, I live here in Dublin, uh, up in the Dudley area in Lawrence County here. Uh, I have three small children, Will, Thomas, and Cora. They all attend uh, public schools here in Lawrence County. My wife works at the Oconee Fall Line Technical College. I was born, uh, well not born, but raised up in this community. I left uh, after attending West Lawrence High School, went up to the University of Georgia and then to uh, Sanford uh, University over in Birmingham, Alabama and graduated from the Cumberland School of Law. Immediately after finishing law school, I came back here to Lawrence County and started uh, in private practice, practicing law uh, with some local attorneys here. Uh, and that is what I've done for the past uh, 13 and a half years prior to being appointed to the bench by Governor Kemp. I have a long and strong uh, work ethic. Uh, I've been working since the day I turned 15. Um, started bagging groceries down at Kroger. Worked for Tom Sharp, putting in sprinkler systems around here. Uh, worked for, uh, through college and through law school. Uh, worked for food services at UGA and the, and the law library at the uh, Cumberland School of Law. And I believe that work ethic and um, it was one of the reasons that Governor Kemp chose to appoint me to the bench, that along with my broad range of experience and my suitability for this position. I've had a smooth transition to the bench and I think that's been aided by the fact that I have been exposed to so many different areas of the law, both domestic, civil, and criminal, pretty much everything that comes before the Superior Courts on a routine basis. Um, and I have prior experience uh, making decisions. Um, I have served as a municipal court judge for the city of East Dublin and a hearing officer for the Department of Community Health handling certificate of need appeals. Um, so again, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have a broad range of experience. I'm doing a, a good job. I'm providing a valuable public service for the community and I ask for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Mr. Faircloth. Hey everybody, my name is Brandon Faircloth and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself similar to what Trey did, both my background is also as to what I do now and why I believe I would be the best candidate for judge. I graduated from Trinity here in Dublin back in 1995. After that I went straight to Mercer University in Macon. I actually lived here at home and, and drove back and forth when I went to college at Mercer University and then straight out of Mercer University College, I went to Mercer University Law School for seven years. I was keeping I-16 hot, pretty much, going back and forth to Macon. When I graduated from Mercer University Law School, I wanted to come back here because I actually had interned at our DA's office here where I work now while I was in law school. I interned there. I also interned at the House of County DA's office. But there wasn't a slot open at the time. I wound up having to send out applications to different places and I ended up at the Covington DA's office, which is Newton County. I worked there for about two and a half years. I got promoted fairly quickly to be the drug prosecutor, so I was handling all of the felony drug cases for Newton County. And I really enjoyed that, because I enjoy prosecution a lot. But I did feel like I needed exposure and experience with civil law, just to see how well I enjoyed it, and to get kind of a taste of what that was. And so I left there and went to Cassin Lay, which is an Alpharetta workers compensation firm, they're actually one of the best workers' compensation firms in the state, and the senior partner there 
writes one of the workers' compensation books for Georgia, and I actually <laughs> worked on that some while I was there. I did like that, but I missed prosecution, and I missed feeling like I was helping people every day to a greater extent than I felt like I could do doing that type of work. So Craig Frazier was DA. He called me. He had an open slot, and I immediately came back. That was in 2006, and I've been back ever since. Since then, I've got promoted to deputy chief and then chief assistant district attorney a number of years ago, and I continue to serve in that role here. Just like this judge position, we cover all four counties. And over the course of, well, I graduated law school in 2002. I came back here in 2006. So I've been here for about 18 years, been a lawyer about 22 years. I've handled thousands of cases. I've had probably close to 200 trials. I've had almost two dozen murder trials. I've done a lot of appeals, both at the Court of Appeals and the Georgia Supreme Court. And so it's given me a vast amount of experience in a variety of fields related to the courtroom, but specifically it's given me over two decades of knowing every aspect of what a courtroom needs to be, what it needs to look like, and how it needs to run. And I'm proud to say I've dedicated almost all of that time right here so over my community. And so I do feel like both of these guys are my friends and they're both nice people. I am the best candidate. I'm by far the most qualified candidate, and I would ask for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Childers. My name is Brad Childers, and we are friends. We may not be friends when this is over with, <laughs> but we're friends now. <laughs> I was born and raised here in Lawrence County, and uh, I am running for Superior Court Judge. I am married to Jennifer Sumner Childers from Wrightsville, and we have three kids, Ford, Everett, and Jerry Lee and we live in the big city of Montrose. Uh, I have spent my entire legal career inside the courtroom as a litigator. Uh, this June will mark 16 years that I have been practicing law, and 12 of those years has been as an assistant district attorney. I started my career over here working at the DA's office here in Dublin. I left there and went into private practice after about six years, and I did private practice here in Dublin for about four years, and then I went back to assistant district attorney's position, but in a adjacent uh, circuit, which is the Oconee circuit, includes Dodge County, and I'm the chief assistant over there now. I have handled everything from a murder case to a speeding case, from a divorce case to an adoption, and everything in between. I have argued cases in front of the Supreme Court of Georgia and the Georgia Court of Appeals. I have practiced law on a regular basis in front of seven different Superior Court judges. My slogan for this campaign is Experience Matters. You'll see my signs throughout the community. On the bottom of it, it says Experience Matters. Matters. A Superior Court judge needs to rely on their legal experiences when navigating in the court. This is not a job for on-the-job training. A judge should be well-rounded in the practice of law to be efficient and effective. I feel I am the most qualified for this position. I ask for your vote for Superior Court Judge of the Dublin Judicial Circuit. Thank you. Mr. Childers, would you uh, share with us what influenced your decision to seek the Superior Court Judge position? Well, I have done uh, just about everything you can do in the courtroom. Uh, I remember when I started as Assistant DA, uh, Fred Larson told me, he said, it's going to take you between three and five years to see just about everything that comes through as far as assistant DA. And, and he, he was right. Uh, it took me about five years, and I saw just about every kind of case. And in private practice, I handled just about everything that came through the door. Because in private practice, as someone has said before, that is usually the most dignified way to starve to death sometimes because the economy goes down and people don't want to spend any money. So you take whatever comes through the door. And I just feel I have reached a, a point in my career that it's time to run for judge, and I've been seeking that ever since last, last year, about this time is when I started, thinking that Judge Gillis was actually going to work out his last year, but he had to retire early. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go to Mr. Faircloth. Uh, what influenced your decision to seek the Superior Court judge position? Honestly, because this is my home, I don't, I've never had some big aspiration to become judge up until <coughs> the last year or two. And the time has come where I see issues, I see 
things that can be changed and made better. And I'm devoted to this community and to our legal process. <laughs> my entire life has revolved around my family and our judicial system. I actually met my wife, Leslie, working at the DA's office. She came to work there as an assistant district attorney in 2009. First time I ever met her. We wound up falling in love and getting married. And obviously that's the best thing I've ever gotten out of that job, but it's, it's one of many. I can't think of a, a better place to live and it's worth fighting for. And it's a place that deserves the best. It deserves the best justice. It deserves the best process. It deserves something where every person who comes in that courtroom knows they're gonna be treated fairly. Their work and the cases are gonna be dealt with efficiently. And when we're out in the community, we know that we're safe and that the job that can be done is being done. And I think more than anybody, I'm uniquely positioned to do that. And so again, it's something that's very personal to me. It's not something that I came to lightly, but it's something that I felt like I needed to do, that I had to do, and I'm proud to be doing it. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, what, uh, what would you say influenced your decision to seek re-election? Well, number one, I want to keep my job, right? Seeking re-election, my decision to initially put my name uh, in the running for Superior Court judge was, uh, was out of a, a desire to be in public service, right? To give back to the community that's been so good to me over these years. To make sure that the community that I'm raising my children in, right, that my family lives in and works in, uh, is protected. That we are doing things the correct way, that we are supporting all of our community law enforcement, that we're protecting the rights of the accused. Again, that we're making sure that we're providing a good and valuable public service to the community, and I think that's what we're doing. By all objective standards, my office is functioning properly. We are getting the job done, and you know that was what initially led me to it, was to make sure that that office functions properly, that I am uh, giving back to the community and protecting the community, and, and I believe I'm doing a good job. I'm Carlos Jones and to me, experience matters. And I believe Brad is the man for the job. I met Brad um, years ago um, when I started in um, juvenile probation. He actually trained me and taught me a lot. Um, I watched him, how we worked with the young kids and how it, it didn't matter who it was that he was working with, he was always loving and fair to them. And he would fight for kids in the courtroom. And so I, I just really believe he's the man for the job, even after me. Um, leaving the Department of Juvenile Justice behind him, um, going into the education field. There's been times I had to call on him um, just for some advice with things, and he was always open um, to giving me that advice. So um, I truly strongly support Brad Childers. Since 1916, Gravely has been designed, engineered, and made right here in the USA. Whether you prefer gas or electric, every Gravely has been forged with the commercial landscaper in mind. So they're not only built to last, but to also keep you riding comfortably from dawn to dusk. So ask yourself, are you ready to graduate to a Gravely? Visit your local Gravely dealer today. Hey, I'm TJ with Dublin Outdoors and Power Sports, formerly known as Myers Equipment Supply. We're your full line dealer for Gravely Lawnmower sales and service. Spring has sprung and inventory is popping up everywhere at Dublin Chevy GMC. Whether it's a Canyon or an HD Silverado, we have what you're looking for. With rates as low as 2.9 for 72 months, come pick your Silverado or Sierra. Or if you're looking for a full-size SUV, we have a great selection of Yukons and Tahoes. Remember to visit MyDublinChevrolet.com for all your sales or service needs. Remember, Don sells cars and trucks well only at Dublin Chevy GMC. Jared is one of the most loyal and dependable people I know. Jared was always first and foremost to volunteer to, to be assistants or do anything that he could when our youth group would go off. He's the kind of guy that it doesn't really matter where you're at, uh, he's got a way and a means to get to you. He's hard working. He is a man uh, beyond reproach. Having someone in, in the political realm that, that you can trust and depend on and um, knowing what I know personally about Jared. Um, that's the sort of elected official I want representing me and taking care of my community. Elect Jerry Matthews, your next commissioner. 
He will be the person that you need, a person that you can trust. On behalf of our family, our very active family, we ask that you take your family to the polls May 21st to vote. Jared Mathis, District 3, Lawrence County Commissioner. Hey, I'm Glenn Register with Hometown Supply. Anything they need for us to do, we do. We give warranty with everything, new and new. You can get what we call a tractor style mower that's less expensive than a zero turn is. You can spend basically half the money and do the same job. You come down and look at what we have, we service it, we get parts for it. We can take it down there behind the store. We got a place down there we cut, show them everything about it. Take it out, set it up, do the financing on it, payment where you can handle it. You can get whatever you want and just about name your game. This is a one-stop shop. And remember, if you can't do business here, you just can't do business. Hi, I'm Meg Greer Evans with Middle Georgia Estate Planning. If you need help with any type of estate planning, whether that's a will, a trust, financial power of attorney, or a health care directive, give us a call. We'd be glad to assist you or consult with you and your loved one about long-term care. Our phone number is 478-272-2885, or you can visit our website at middlegeorgiaestateplanning.com. Spring is in the air at Roach Farm and Garden. Flower beds and garden looking kind of sketchy? Let us soil test. Need new plants? Roach Farm and Garden just got a huge shipment of ferns and tropicals. Looking for Mother's Day gifts? Roach Farm and Garden has you covered. Garden accessories, flags, wind chimes, and more. Time to get those salt licks out for the deer. Roach Farm and Garden carries trophy rocks and 50 pound mineral blocks. Don't forget, Roach Farm and Garden has a full line of deer feed. Looking for some shade? Roach Farm and Garden has you covered. Pecan trees, fruit trees, and ornamentals. And while you're picking up your tree, check out our huge selection of concrete statues. In the need for seed? Roach Farm and Garden carries everything you need for your garden or farm. And as always, Roach Farm and Garden carries feed for just about everything. Have a happy Mother's Day from all of us at Roach Farm and Garden. Two locations, Dublin and Wrightsville. Hi, I'm Tom Dominey. Here at Dublin Wynn Nelson, we pride ourselves on providing the industry's highest quality products at the most competitive pricing. We are a full service wholesaler specializing in plumbing, irrigation, and industrial products. With a staff that collectively offers more than 50 years of expertise, our team knows your industry and we can answer your questions and help you get the parts and equipment you need. From Moen to Renai, we carry the plumbing, irrigation, and industrial products you need from the brands you trust. We also carry a great lineup of Milwaukee tools. At Dublin with Nelson, our goal is the long-term success of your business. We achieve that goal with a simple commitment, doing things right, one customer at a time. If you have a question, or if you're looking for a hard-to-find part, give us a call. Our experts are ready to help. Order online, give us a call, or come by at 507 Airport Road in Dublin. We're committed to building long-term relationships with our customers by earning your business every day. I've always uh, sort of had my rudder uh, pointed at public service. I was very grateful that I had the opportunity and was given the opportunity by our governor, Governor Kemp, to uh, serve in this position. And as I said before, I feel like I'm providing valuable public service to the community, um, and I feel like I'm serving well. I would say that my private practice, which was based here in Dublin and took me uh, to superior courts throughout the Dublin Judicial Circuit and some outside the Dublin Judicial Circuit, but being in private practice exposes you to um, not just criminal cases, not just civil cases, but a good mix of both. I'm confident to say that I've handled pretty much every type of case that comes before a superior court judge and so that's allowed me uh, as I said before to hit the ground running and to really not skip a beat in my transition from being an advocate and a lawyer to sitting on the bench and making decisions on behalf of the people of the Dublin Judicial Circuit. I will also add that I was previously municipal court judge for the city of East Dublin. I did that for about a year and a half and I have previously served as an administrative hearing officer for the uh, Department of Community Health for the state of Georgia. Um, and so I do have prior uh, judicial uh, experience and I have made decisions. I have analyzed the law 
and, uh, and applied it to the facts of the cases that have come before me in the past, so I feel like I have the experience it takes to effectively get this job done. I believe that I have demonstrated that I can capably and competently handle this job, and I believe that I deserve to be elected a full term as a Superior Court judge. I'll start with you for our next question. From a judicial standpoint, what do you feel are some of the primary issues that need to be addressed in our district? I would say, Keith, Heath, the, the, the biggest issue we have is make sure that we move cases timely through the system. Um, that is a, an issue that we've heard about in some of the other debates tonight, but making sure that we are timely moving cases through the judicial system uh, is an important process. I was looking at my trial calendar that's coming up uh, in mid-April. We have cases that the commit date on those offenses was 2017, okay? That's a long time ago. We need to get that case moving. The problem was it wasn't indicted until 2022. So now we're working with a very old case, and of course we had COVID. There were a lot of challenges during that time frame, and I know that the people who were involved in the system at that point in time did the very best they could under the constraints that we were operating under, but we need to make sure that we're moving cases through the system in a timely fashion, that we're being efficient with our time and our resources and moving things along and getting things accomplished for the community. Thank you. Mr. Uh, let's see, Mr. Faircloth. From a judicial standpoint, what do you feel are some of the primary issues that need to be addressed in our district? I can think of three big things. I'm not saying this is it, but this is definitely three of the big ones. First, yeah, cases do need to move quicker, but that's easy to say. That's what everybody always says. Well, we need cases to move faster. Sure you do. Practically, the way that happens has less with just saying, let's make it move faster, because everybody's gonna try to make it move faster and it's making foundational changes that will make it go faster. You have to understand that we have a limited number of judges, courtrooms, and jurors. So you're essentially, if you take all of the cases that could be tried and you try to actually try them, it's like trying to drink a pond through a straw. You can't do it. You have to drain the pond. You have to have regular, consistent verdicts, regular, consistent sentences. You have to have, when required and when necessary and appropriate, harsh sentences, and when required and as appropriate, you need to hold people to plea offers and make sure that they understand if they do decide to roll the dice and go to trial, which is their right, and they always have that right, if they are convicted, they may very well face a significant consequence for that. That's the only way it, to ensure that people don't game the system, that when they really want a trial, they get one, and it's completely fair, and their rights are completely protected. But by the same token, we don't reward people who just are playing games, who will not accept responsibility. And we treat everybody fairly, not just the ones that play the game and not just the ones that are honestly accept responsibility. So that's number one, is ensuring at every level, from bond to motions to trials to sentencing, that there is in place consistent and when necessary, strict verdicts and sentences for these individuals. Now, second thing, there needs to be more efficiency in the way that day-to-day -day court runs. A lot of time is lost because there's so many people. You're having to maneuver different lawyers, different defendants, witnesses for hearings, and to some extent you can only do so much because it's like herding cats. But it can be run better, it can be more structured, and also one thing I've identified routinely for the last few years since we've had the technology to do it, there's a lot of things that can be done with regards to inmates that can be done remotely from the jail. It would save a lot of money. It would make it safer for our law enforcement and for the people in the courthouse to not constantly be carrying inmates back and forth to the courthouse unless it's something that requires their physical presence because only some things do. The things that can be done remotely through Zoom or through some other video chat needs to be done that way and that would be safer and it would save a ton of time because the sheriff's office has to spend so much time, energy, and money plus put themselves at risk constantly carrying inmates for them not to have anything actually happen with their case or it be something that can be taken care of in two minutes over a video call. The third thing is we need at its core to have a system in place where when cases are being dealt with and when particularly with serious violent crime cases are being dealt with, there are assurances in place as to are these people going to get out, are they going to continue to commit further crimes. 
we have a problem with violent crime. We're not going to solve that by just wishing it away. When you've got somebody who does not meet the bond criteria and they've committed a violent crime, every case has to be judged on its own. But a lot of these people that are committed violent offenses should be staying in jail until they have their day in court, a trial. And if they are convicted of something that warrants a prison sentence, they need to get a prison sentence and they need to be removed from our community if that, again, is the appropriate sentence. And I keep saying that because we're not prejudging these cases, but as a general theme, if you have somebody who's violent and they've been convicted, they probably don't need to stay in our community. And if you've got somebody who is younger, who does not have a bad record, and they can be saved from that lifestyle, they can be removed from a gang, they can be kept from a bad family situation, we need to have the structures in place to protect them, to guide them away from that. Part of that may be probation if they committed crimes, or at the very least, keep them away from the individuals that would drag them down and put them and our entire community at risk. Thank you. I want to remind you, if you could, try to keep your answer to two minutes. I'm sorry, I'll run. <laughs> uh, Mr. Childers, from a judicial standpoint, what do you feel are some of the primary issues that need to be addressed? Well, the dockets. You know, the dockets out of control because we got old cases. You, I don't care if you're a defendant or a victim or a witness. You shouldn't have to wait three and four and five years before you go to court. You should go ahead and be in court. I understand that the DA's office may not indict until 2022 on a 17 case. I, I, I totally get that. But once it gets in court, it needs to move pretty quickly. Now, how do you do that? That's simple. You have more court. Nobody wants more court. The lawyers don't want it. The clerk doesn't want it. The sheriff's department doesn't want it. But that's the only way to get control of it. If you have 100 cases and you keep doing the same thing and you add a, another 100 cases to it, you're never going to dig out of the hole. You have to have more court. We have a jail court at the Lawrence County Jail. Now, the other, other counties I don't think has that. But we can do that here in Lawrence County. We can save money by having jail court out there. We can, um, we, we, we put in too many cases on a calendar. When they have a calendar that's got nearly 100 cases, there ain't no way they can get all these subpoenas out. If we have more court days with less cases on it, so the DA's office and the public defender or whomever cases we're dealing with can focus on just those 30 cases, let's knock 20 of those out. Let's move to another one. Every judge has a roughly seven days during the month that they don't have court. If we add two days out of the month, two extra days for court, eventually we're going to get control of it. We can't sit on our hands. We have to work. We have to have more court. Thank you. I'm going to start back with you again on this one, Mr. Childers. Uh, talk to us about how you handle cases involving topics such as race, gender, or religion. Well, you know, I'm going to follow the rule of law, but no two cases are the same. Uh, every case is different. There will never be two cases the same. There's always circumstances around the cases on facts that you need to take in consideration. So I can't say how I would handle a case like that without knowing the facts that surround it. I'm gonna apply the law to it, but I'm gonna to listen to the facts. I may have the same guy commit the same crime, but it's different days, it's different victims. So that's a hard question to handle uh, and to ask and to answer. But I think the thing to do is to look at the facts and the circumstances around that case, apply the law, but listen to what the circumstances are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farrakaloth, how do you handle cases involving sensitive topics such as race, gender, or religion? Well, I think that there's a couple of different things you have to look at. The first thing is bear in mind that cases, and when we say cases, be it a lawsuit or some type of criminal civil action where the core focus is on some type of bias or prejudice or hate crime or discrimination based on one of these criteria, a lot of times this is going to be a federal case, which is an entirely different system. It's not a case that would come before us. We have a state system, a state court, then right across we have a federal courthouse. And those type of cases a lot of times will be handled in that court. That being said, there certainly are state cases that would have those components. And a lot of cases that will have some element of some type of bias or prejudice potentially there. The answer is real simple. 
One, you treat everybody the same. It doesn't matter who somebody is, what they look like, how much money they've got. You treat everybody fairly, both in and out of the courtroom. There are things that are going to protect people to some extent legally as far as what you can do and what you can't do to keep people from being ugly to each other, from keep people from being unfair. But that only goes so far. You have to not only have that law, you have to know that law, and you have to enforce that law, and you have to do it every time. And so while, again, a lot of core racial bias or, or sexual bias cases will not come before us, those components and those prejudices can come up, and it's our job to make sure they are dealt with, they are eliminated, and that everybody is treated fair, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case, that that does not become a component of our judgment or the proceedings before us. Thank you. And Mr. Taylor, um, describe to us how you handle cases involving sensitive topics such as race, gender, or religion. Thank you, Heath. I'm going to have a really quick answer to that, so I want to go back and address a couple other things. I held a video Zoom conference this morning with an inmate from Ware State Prison from the Trutland County Courthouse. I do that regularly and routinely. I think it's a great idea, and I think we ought to do more of it. The jail staff that's sitting on the front row of this thing, they, of, of this road, they'll tell you, I go to the jail routinely to handle matters, so it keeps deputies off the road. It keeps people in a secure facility so that we're not exposing the public to dangerous criminals. I do it on a routine basis. Ask them. I have court on Fridays. I had a deputy stop me last Friday and say, hey, you got court next Friday. What's up with that? We got court on Fridays now? Yeah, I schedule court on Fridays because I work every day of the week. Special, we talked about seven days where we don't have court. Well, you have civil court too, and you have people who call and request special settings for long, lengthy domestic cases. That eats up a lot of time. There's also a lot of motion work that has to get done in the office. And so we have to have days to get office work done. We don't just sit on the bench all the time. We have office work that has to be done. So handling cases with race, gender, or religion. Here's what I do. I treat everybody with respect, be courteous, and be accommodating, but follow the rule of law, consistently apply it without fear, favor, or prejudice. Hello, my name's Jeff Davis, and I'm asking you to re-elect me as your county commissioner for District 3. In my time on the Board of Commissioners, I've been the taxpayer's watchdog. As a result, property taxes are one half of surrounding counties, and we have a healthy surplus. Public safety, infrastructure and equipment, economic development, and quality of life have been and will always be my top priorities. Please vote for me, Jeff Davis, for County Commissioner, District 3. Thank you and God bless. I graduated from West Lawrence High School in 1994 and my first love was agriculture. Uh, I was not focused on college and never thought about law school. I was focused on farming and driving tractors and being outside and watching crops grow and harvest time. That's, that's where my love was at. Uh, I did that for about four or five years after high school. And I knew that I, I always wanted to have something to do with agriculture, but I needed to get a degree. So I went back to school and to college, and I got a four-year degree. Uh, I took a job as a probation officer. Now, during that four or five-year time, I got my CDLs and drove a truck. In fact, I'm probably the only attorney around here that has CDLs and still drives occasionally. But I took that job as a probation officer and I did that for about a year and I decided I wanted to go to law school. I did not fit the cookie cut mold of what a law school student should be or they think should be. I was not a traditional student. I was a non-traditional student because I was married at the time and I had worked in the workforce. So I went to law school at night, driving three days a week from Lawrence County to Atlanta at night for three and a half years. That's how I got my law degree. I was not born with common knowledge and none of us are. We are not born knowing that fire is hot and ice is cold. We're either taught that or we observe that. Knowledge is gained through events and experience. I told you that my slogan was experience matters, but that does not just go for legal experiences. 
It goes for real life experience. I have real life experience. Our court system needs a judge to bring to the bench real life experience. A judge that can relate to the common working man or woman. A judge who understands that not every job is nine to five and not everybody just works 40 hours a week. A judge who recognizes that people do live paycheck to paycheck. A judge that will look at all the circumstances and all the facts and consider all of that in the ruling. If you feel the way I feel, I'm asking for your vote for Superior Court Judge of the Dublin Judicial Circuit. Please vote Bradford Children's for Judge. Hello, my name is Mike Robertson. I've decided after prayer and talking to folks, I'm gonna to try to run for county commissioner, give it a try. Some of the things I'm interested in is getting back to helping folks. Let's, uh, let's get back into people helping business. I've seen that dwindle down over 40 years. I just retired three years ago with 36 years with the county. So I know about the bills, I know what comes in and where, I, where we can help that. And there's just a lot can be done. But I will promise this, everybody in district too, if you need me, I'm right here. I'll be there. I will be a good steward of the taxpayers' money. We will tighten up and we'll know where everything's going. And any big projects that come along, I want the public involved in it. I'm back in the Sheriff's Department, EMS, back in 100%. Believe in public safety. We've got to get these roads safe again for everybody. With these new businesses coming to Lawrence County, we've got to work on our infrastructure. We've got to get these roads back right again and we got to keep them right. I would appreciate if everybody would go out and vote for me as county commissioner, and I'll try not to let anyone down. I've always uh, sort of had my rudder uh, pointed at public service. I was very grateful that I had the opportunity and was given the opportunity by our governor, Governor Kemp, to uh, serve in this position. And as I said before, I feel like I'm providing valuable public service to the community. Um, and I feel like I'm serving well. I would say that my private practice, which was based here in Dublin and took me uh, to superior courts throughout the Dublin Judicial Circuit and some outside the Dublin Judicial Circuit, but being in private practice exposes you to um, not just criminal cases, not just civil cases, but a good mix of both. I'm confident to say that I've handled pretty much every type of case that comes before a superior court judge. And so that's allowed me, uh, as I said before, to hit the ground running and to really not skip a beat in my transition from being an advocate and a lawyer to sitting on the bench and making decisions on behalf of the people of the Dublin Judicial Circuit. I will also add that I was previously municipal court judge for the city of East Dublin. I did that for about a year and a half and I have previously served as an administrative hearing officer for the uh, Department of Community Health for the state of Georgia. Um, and so I do have prior uh, judicial uh, experience and I have made decisions. I have analyzed the law and uh, and applied it to the facts of the cases that have come before me in the past so I feel like I have the experience it takes to effectively get this job done. I believe that I have demonstrated that I can capably and competently handle this job and I believe that I deserve to be elected a full term as a Superior Court Judge. Hello, I'm Jared Mathis, candidate for Lawrence County District 3 Commissioner. We're out here at the WH Bud Baron Airport, which is a welcome mat to all business in the Dublin. It's vital that the county commissioners keep the airport in a presentable and working order at all times as we never know who may come in and out. And this is the first impression that they get when they're coming to do business in Dublin and Lawrence County. Also, other items on my agenda is, is to keep improving public safety. We have great public safety departments and I want to make them even better. Our first responders are second to none and Lawrence County is revered among all surrounding counties as having one of the best group of firefighters, the best sheriff's department and the best EMS department, one of the best of those in the state. And we must keep continuing to improve those type services. One thing I would love to do our ambulances right now are all currently located in the city and I want to keep those ambulances right there in the city. The city residents have a lot of calls and they need those ambulances, but our ambulances are stretched thin. So we need to add additional ambulances and additional personnel and we need to place strategically some of those units out in the county. I'll work as a county commissioner to, to secure the funding 
and make sure we have the pay in, in line with other surrounding agencies to be sure we can make that happen. So perhaps we can get an ambulance to your community. My goal as a Lawrence County Commissioner is not only to just look after District 3, but I want to look after the county as a whole. Because if the county as a whole is successful, District 3 will also be successful. I also have plans to get with local developers. Let's see what we can do to bring in more residential construction to Lawrence County. I have been in the construction industry for over 20 years, same as the amount of time I've been in the fire department, and I can tell you residential construction drives business. It creates jobs, it gives subs jobs, it, it creates people in your restaurants, it brings people in from out of town, people spend money, Construction makes an economy, especially a local economy, thrive. We need to get more residential construction in Dublin and Lawrence County so we can help our residents achieve the American dream of home ownership. Please go to the polls on Tuesday, May 21st and cast your ballot for Jared Mathis, District 3 County Commissioner. I will certainly appreciate your vote. Thank you. I'll start with you on this question. Describe your experience with alternative dispute resolution in that process. In private practice, I mediated lots of cases, whether it be civil cases, whether it be tort cases for car wrecks. Um, mediate a lot of domestic cases. I believe that is a fantastic tool that the courts should employ when appropriate. A lot of times folks don't want to mediate cases, but I have a mediator assigned to my courtroom on all of my motion days, and I always make an announcement every single, every single morning that I have a mediator available to speak with folks if they are interested in participate, participating in that process. Again, it's not something that's required. It's not something where you are forced to reach a resolution, but we do like to make that available. We have an ADR program here in this circuit um, we've got some great people that work in that program, and I think they're fantastic mediators, and they're really good at helping people reach resolutions to their disputes. Again, it's not appropriate in all cases, and it's not going to always work to help us find a resolution, but I think it's a great tool. I think we ought to employ it more often, and I'm glad that that's something that we have invested in in the past is making that available to the litigants in our community. Thank you. Mr. Faircloth, describe your experience with alternative dispute resolution process. Yes, sir. I'll echo what Trey was saying, the fact that definitely it's a great tool when it comes to civil cases. There's going to be a lot of things that it's just people disagreeing. It's about money or hurt feelings or something that can potentially be resolved short of tying up court, tying up these people, their time, their money for an extended period of time through a mediation process. But the other thing I will say, which I think is potentially as or more important and ties into a big concern we have here is how can those so same type of processes be used more in criminal proceedings? There is an idea of something called pretrial resolution. It's not something that, of course, the court can force on anybody. But what I will do when I'm judge is have court days and set up structures where attorneys from both the prosecution, the DA's office, and defense attorneys can be brought together on cases where it's appropriate to see if there is some type of pretrial resol resolution that can be worked out. What does that mean? Well, if you've got somebody who's a drug addict, it may be that there's somebody who needs to go to rehab. If it's something where something was stolen, it may be something where restitution can be worked out. It may be that with some of these people that are at risk use, that are getting involved in gang life but have not done anything violent yet, that there are programs in the community that we can use and that can be created to help facilitate them being removed from that, whether that's a faith-based alternative or just something through their school or something else. There are a lot of these cases that just like the civil cases, a simple conversation can solve. We can resolve things. We can get people the fair punishment that they deserve when they deserve it. But we can also make sure that the victims are protected and that they're satisfied with the result. And by doing that, on a day-by-day, case-by-case basis and dedicating a process to that, we can clear out so much of the space and save that time and that energy in that courtroom for the things that have to go to trial. Your murders, your sexual offenses, your gang offenses, things that this community needs resolved quickly. More space and more time will be available by resolving more of these other cases through this process when it can be. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll move to you now, Mr. Childers. Describe your experience with alternative dispute resolution. Well, in private practice, I use mediation a good bit. It's a, it's a great way to, to settle, usually divorce cases, uh, to sit down with both parties and, and go through it. Uh, a lot of times they just want to be heard and, and just talking in a room, it, it works. It's a great thing. I, I remember Judge Gillis, when I was in private practice, he would tell everybody, say, listen, you're gonna at least try mediation. You're going to go upstairs, and I would always tell my clients, I said, we're going to go up there. You may not agree with it, but we have to sit there and just listen to the mediator for just a few minutes, and then if you still don't agree, then we'll go back downstairs. And nine times out of ten, it came, you know, it settled the case. It's a good thing. Uh, as far as a prosecutor, I have used a lot of pretrial diversions and pretrial abeyance orders, and they, they work great, especially with... Uh, young offenders that's got some type of misdemeanor uh, charge or something to try to deal with them in a pretrial way so they don't have a record. I'm all about pretrial orders and pretrial uh, abeyance orders. And the last thing that I use uh, a lot of times is a court cost. You know, people have a case and they come to court and then they don't, uh, they don't want to move forward with it. So I, I, I tend to make them pay some type of court cost as a prosecutor, and I'm all about that as if I was a superior court judge. I would impose the court cost, and not to deter them from wanting to come back to court again, but send a message, listen, this is on the docket now, we're dealing with it, you got your day in court. So those three things I use a lot in my job as it is now. Thank you. I'm gonna start with you, uh, Mr. Childers, on your closing statement. If you would, please try to stay as close as you can to two minutes. Well, thank you for having me tonight, and uh, I am not your typical attorney, I, and I will not be your typical judge. I, most attorneys go from high school to college to law school, and I did not. I graduated from West Lawrence High School in 1994, and my first love was agriculture. Uh, I was not focused on college and never thought about law school. I was focused on farming and driving tractors and being outside, watching crops grow in harvest time. That's, that's where my love was at. Uh, I did that for about four or five years after high school. And I knew that I, I always wanted to have something to do with agriculture, but I needed to get a degree. So I went back to school and to college, and I got a four-year degree. Uh, I took a job as a probation officer. Now, during that four or five-year time, I got my CDLs and drove a truck. In fact, I'm probably the only attorney around here that has CDLs and still drives occasionally. But I took that job as a probation officer and I did that for about a year and I decided I wanted to go to law school. I did not fit the cookie cut mold of what a law school student should be or they think should be. I was not a traditional student. I was a non-traditional student because I was married at the time and I had worked in the workforce. So I went to law school at night, driving three days a week from Lawrence County to Atlanta at night for three and a half years. That's how I got my law degree. I was not born with common knowledge and none of us are. We are not born knowing that fire is hot and ice is cold. We're either taught that or we observe that. Knowledge is gained through events and experience. I told you that my slogan was experience matters, but that does not just go for legal experiences. It goes for real life experience. I have real life experience. Our court system needs a judge to bring to the bench real life experience. A judge that can relate to the common working man or woman. A judge who understands that not every job is nine to five and not everybody just works 40 hours a week. A judge who recognizes that people do live paycheck to paycheck. A judge that will look at all the circumstances and all the facts and consider all of that in the ruling. If you feel the way I feel, I'm asking for your vote for Superior Court Judge of the Dublin Judicial Circuit Please vote Bradford Childers for judge. Thank you, sir. Mr. Faircloth, I want to remind you, if you can, stay to two minutes. I'll do my best. Y'all, this is not really about us. It's not about me or Trey or Brad. It's about you. 
people here, people at home, people watching this on YouTube. If something happened tomorrow, and either you or somebody you loved had to go to the hospital, and they needed surgery, would you want a surgeon that had not been in the courtroom much, or the operating room much, or would you want a surgeon who had done a few operations, or would you be saying, give me the most experienced, most knowledgeable surgeon in this hospital, because this is my life, this is the people I love, this is the things that mean the most to me. That's what we're dealing with in the courtroom every day. People don't come to the courtroom because they're having a good time in their life. Whether it's they're on trial for something, or they're a victim in something, they're going through divorce, they've been hurt. In most circumstances, they are in one of the most critical and potentially worst times in their life. And they need to have a judge there that knows what they're doing, that knows the law, and has a vast amount of experience to handle all the different situations that come up. That's me. That is not why you should vote for me judge. That is the point. The bigger thing is I'm honest, I'm fair, and I'm dedicated to this community. My wife is an attorney in our office. She's dedicated to this community. My mother taught for 25 years between Twiggs Academy and West La Northwest Lawrence Elementary. She's dedicated to this community. This is our home. We love it. And I've done everything I can to work towards not only doing my job and keeping this community safe, but putting myself in a position that when I come here now, I can freely ask for your vote without any reservation. Not because I'm entitled to it. I don't come from a wealthy family. My grandfather was a welder and has a shop at a flea market. My mother was a school teacher. I don't have a lot of lawyers or doctors in my family or anything like that. But I have spent the last over two decades reaching the point of knowing what I'm doing, how the courtroom needs to run, and what this community needs to go forward in the best way possible. So I do ask for your vote on May 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, your closing remarks. Thank you, Heath. When I took the bench eight months ago, I did so with three goals in mind, that being efficient, effective, and strategic about the way that we were doing things in the Dublin Judicial Circuit, and in particular in the Superior Court Judge's offices. By all objective standards, ladies and gentlemen, we are achieving those goals. I've handled every type of case that's come before me uh, with dignity, with uh, integrity, and I believe that we are getting the job done. What I'm asking you to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to base your decision on the evidence that you have in front of you. That's what we are required to do in the courtroom is to base our decisions, our rulings, on the evidence that has been brought into court. Not what could be, not what we hope for the future, not what we think could potentially happen, but the evidence that has been brought before us. What I've brought before you is that I'm a competent and capable Superior Court judge. My opponents, they are fine people. We are good friends, and I appreciate the fact that they've offered themselves for public service, but what you have, as far as evidence, is that they are good assistant district attorneys. Mr. Childers is a good assistant to district attorney in a different circuit, and he serves those people well. And Mr. Faircloth does a good job of serving the people of Dublin in the Dublin Judicial Circuit as an assistant district attorney there. Mr. Childers, he's a pretty good musician. I'm not. Mr. Faircloth, he's a good author. I'm not. But I am a good Superior Court judge, and we're getting the job done. I'm the only one with prior judicial experience. I've handled every type of case in private practice that routinely comes before a superior court judge. Don't take my word for it, ladies and gentlemen. Talk to the people around this community who say that I'm doing a good job. I'm thoughtful, I'm fair, I'm considerate, and I listen. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we've served the Dublin Judicial Circuit. That's Lawrence, Johnson, Trutland, and Twiggs counties. I'm asking for your vote on May the 21st, 2024. And again, tonight nobody has pointed to anything that I am deficient, any area where I'm not getting the job done. It's not brought up this evening. We're providing a valuable public service for the community, and I'm asking for your vote on May 21st. <laughs>